My freshman philosopher professor assigned this exercise and called it a bucket list. We were supposed to make a list of all the things we wanted to do in our lives before we kicked the bucket. Cutesy. It's pointless now. We could do this. You're listening to Simon Scriver's Amazingly Ultimate Fundraising Superstar Podcast, talking all things fundraising, charities, nonprofits, and more. Here's your host, as always, Simon Scriver. You've all heard of a bucket list. A bucket list is the goals that you aspire to achieve, the little quirky things that you want to do before you get hit by a bus or thrown into a canyon or whatever way you want to die. Um, we've all heard of those. But a new concept to me is this idea of a career bucket list or specifically a fundraising bucket list. Uh, the, the, the things that we want to achieve as professional fundraisers in our career. And this is brought to my attention over on a new blog by the one and only Andy King, who is very kind of uh, to join us today. Hello, Andy. Hello. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Yourself? But, oh, yeah, I'm all right, you know, the usual. Um, and Took you, Andy, are an impressive individual. You, I mean, I think Ooh. you'd be the first to admit you haven't been on the fundraising scene a whole lot of time. No, that's um, true. But you've gone ahead and you've won the Institute of Fundraising's Best Fundraising Newcomer Award. I did. Um, you're a trustee, you're a professional fundraiser, you're a lot, and you've now started blogging, you're very active on social media, you're a lot of things. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> and how was it winning the Newcomer Award? Was that a surprise or did you expect it? Yeah, no, I saw, um, well, I didn't even know that I'd been nominated until I got a tweet from the IOF, like, tagging me in the post. And I immediately looked at my Twitter that was, like, loads of anti-Trump stuff and memes and was like, oh, God. <laughs> um, so that was a surprise in itself. And then on the night, yeah, it was, it was quite a big surprise because the rest of the list was really, really impressive people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was a great, it was a good, good night all round. <laughs> it's awesome. Complain. Congratulations. And what, and what is your day job? Um, I am the partnerships manager for East African Playgrounds. Okay. So I look after our university and corporate partnerships, similar to how a lot of uh, charities run Kilimanjaro climbs, etc. Mm -hmm. We run our own in-house gorilla trek where people trek to see the last remaining silverback gorillas and then they volunteer wow on a playground build so they get to see where the money they've raised has gone. Um, and I head up the team that run that with universities and I also started corporate partnerships from scratch two years wow. ago. So, yeah. is, this, is it a playground for gorillas? It's, it's not. It's a common oh, okay. misconception, uh, <laughs> but, but for, unfortunately not because we don't know if they'd like the swings the way we do. So. <laughs> That's fair. Um, <laughs> and so, so you're, you're reasonably new to the blogging world or you've yes. blogged, but, but in terms of setting up your own blog, um, you have just set one up at responsibleraising.wordpress.com. That's correct. Yes. And the blog that caught my eye was this idea of a fundraising bucket list. How would, how would you describe a fundraising bucket list? Better than yeah. me? Yeah, oh, I'm not sure better than you. Um, it was just a list of, well, it started as my list of things that I wanted to achieve. And then I tried mm -hmm. to expand it out as things that I thought any fundraiser might aspire to achieve in their career. So it's mm -hmm. a fair mix of, of fundraising styles. I've been really fortunate to work for a small charity that's allowed variety. Um, but yeah, it's literally just a, a bucket list for a fundraiser's career um, with a, a fair variety of stuff. And there has been some uh personalizations that have happened because a few people have made it their own including uh callum coker who took the idea and started his complete own bucket list which is pretty cool nice um but yeah i like it because i mean i've um you know i've been at times reasonably driven in my fundraising career and, and i've always had those kind of couple of goals in front of me like i you know before i started speaking i wanted to speak mm -hmm. then i wanted to deliver a plenary i wanted to start a podcast i want you know do all these things and I, I suppose I kind of kept them to myself. I maybe, you know, said them to a couple people close to me. But I just loved this idea that you put them out there. So not making yourself vulnerable, but being really open of like, this is what I want to do. Yeah, for sure. I think for me, there's an element of accountability to it. Yeah. I am the kind of person that likes to tell people my goals because it makes them far more likely that I do them. Um, Clever. So it was a nice, it was a nice way of um, showing some things that I'd already done and was proud of having done and also a lot more things that I was keen to at some point do and know that I would be asked about in time. 
apparently on air. So yeah. Yeah, well, this is this is added pressure. So <laughs> we're, what I'd like to do, if you don't mind, is actually work down the list sure. and scold you for the ones you haven't done yeah, yet. Yeah, here we go. Um, but actually, because some of them you've crossed off. For example, uh -huh. the very the very first one you had on this was that you wanted to write a blog post. Yes, um, correct. Which, which is really clever. I mean, they always say with a to do list, you always the first one you always should be able to cross off straight away. It's always um, my list. Easy. And you've done that. So what what do you think was holding you back from from writing that first blog post if you wanted to already do it? Um, I think I, so I've, I've written a few blog posts before, but I wanted to write one that was uh, specifically for a blog that I would run. And I think I wanted a concept that I thought would genuinely add value. Mm -hmm. um, and as you've already said, I'm quite new to fundraising. I didn't want to try and position myself as this maverick expert with only a few years of experience. <laughs> um, so what I thought I'd rather do was share my learning journey and kind of provide a structure to that and share some things that I have learned from actual experts. Um, and it's it was basically the lack of an idea that I thought people would actually want to read and that I felt I was in a position to write for quite a long time. I like it. And it's a good sign. I mean, it's a great first post. Um, if people are sharing it and people are kind of tweaking it for their own, that's always a good sign. Uh, yeah, I don't think sure. anyone read my first blog post, so, so you <laughs> I, should be very proud. I was fortunate in that some good friends retweeted it from the off, which which that added helps. some added some credibility. But yeah, it was good. That helps. Um, number two, we're just going to skirt over, but you said uh, you want to get a favorite fundraising podcast. Obviously, you know I'm not campaigning can... <laughs> here today, but we can come we can come back to that one. Yeah, sure we can. Number three, you want to read three books on fundraising in a year. Yeah, um, again, as a, a bit of an accountability thing, I've been trying to get more and more into reading resources around fundraising. Um, I think there's a lot of training out there. There's a lot of training that working in a small charity I can't necessarily afford, but there's also a lot of training that's written down and available to the masses. And I know lots of people that own fundraising books, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so I'm just trying to coax myself into reading more of them by putting a timeline and a number okay. on them. Uh, I read two last year, so I'm hoping to read three this year. Yeah, and are you reading one at the moment? I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reading fine. a fiction book uh, that I promised a friend I would finish by the end of February. Okay, fi notably March. <laughs> it's, not, it's not fiction about fundraising. It's unfortunately not, like it. not. We need we need one of those. We do. Um, but uh, if the anyone... fundraiser that wanted more by uh, uh -huh. Rob Woods is is fiction. I've read that okay. one. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. Um, and it, so if anyone has any recommendations that they can send them over to you. Yeah, it's sure. I mean, I find I like I do like fundraising books and there's some really good ones out there. But I find it's like sometimes I'm reading to get away from fundraising. For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get um, that. And that's the hard thing. But three three books is manageable. You can do that. Yeah, for sure. Um, you want to number four, you want to attend an unconventional fundraising event. Um, and the one that you've named here that's on the list to do is Pizza for Losers. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think fundraising is really cool in that there's quite a lot of, um, I want to say anti-conferences in the, mm -hmm. um, or I think the other phrase is like not working, like networking, but not working, okay. um, where the idea is that you can just be yourself and a human version of yourself. Um, and I think the Pizza for Losers idea in particular is really appealing because it's about humans getting to know humans rather than professionals trying to impress each other. Yeah, so this, yeah. this is Nikki Bell's one for anyone that's not familiar. This is Nikki Bell's um, series of events she's organizing where people are sharing their failures over pizza. Yes. Um, and you're speaking at one of them? I am indeed, yeah. Um, the 5th of June in London yeah. um, about how easy it is to fail at maintaining relationships with supporters across continents and how you can also be better at that. So you're not just attending as a loser, you're actually presenting I'm a cheap, as a loser. Cheap loser <laughs> and also highly fighting that pineapple does belong on pizza and I will fight. Oh pizza. really? So, yeah. Uh, oh my god. Oh my god. Okay. Let's yes. just ignore that. Okay, fine. Controversial, um, I know. What what else would you class as an unconventional <laughs> fundraising event? The the other one that comes to mind is fundraising uh camp. Fundraising camp that Howard Lake runs, which is yeah. is kind of unconventional. So there's fundraising um camp by Howard Lake, and mm -hmm. there's also uh, Charity Slam, um, oh, yeah. Yeah. which is a fundraising convention where none of the sessions are given by people in charity. Ah, um, nice. So, for example, Lego ran a session last year, um, and it's about what people can learn from other sectors and apply to themselves in, in a bigger picture. Oh, um, I like that. 
There's another event similar to Pizza for Losers called Cock Up Cocktails, um, <laughs> which is, again, talking about things that maybe haven't worked. Um, yeah, there's a few, and there's, there seems to be more cropping up over time as well, which is nice. Nice. Um, there's one over in Ireland, which I think he's trying to take it international. Um, is that guy called Hack? Yes, that Kevin, yeah. my friend Kevin Delaney runs. And um, that's a good one where he gets kind of four or five charities in a room and um, groups them up with people from different backgrounds, some fundraising, some not fundraising, and they have whatever, eight hours or 12 hours to create a campaign. And that, that's pretty cool. That's a yeah, good one. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, okay, number six, you're talking about speaking at a fundraising conference, which you've already done. I have, yes. Um, I, yep, that's an error. That should be crossed out. Good. And why, <laughs> why, did, why did you want to? I'm, I'm especially curious about this because obviously speaking is a big part of my life now. Uh, and I used to be petrified of speaking. Why, why did you want to do this? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm not that scared of public speaking generally. Um, mm -hmm. I quite enjoy it. Um, I think I've got a huge merit out of listening to other people speak in the past and wanted to get myself to a stage where I was comfortable passing that on, um, mm -hmm. which I did at the Foundation for Social Improvement's Northern Conference, which is a, a conference specifically for small charities. Um, and then that session went quite well, and I'm giving it again at the fundraising convention, um, which is equally terrifying and exciting. Um, and that was the first time you'd ever presented on fundraising? Um, so I've run information meetings um, okay, okay. for the for the Gorilla Track Challenge I took okay, about sure. earlier, but it was the first time I'd spoken to a bunch of fundraising professionals about yeah, fundraising. Yeah. yeah, for sure. That's scary. The, the thing that used to scare me most about it when I started was question, the idea of questions. So people yeah. asking questions that would just make you look stupid that you didn't know. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I my first experience, I was totally taken aback by because I, for some reason, I thought it was multiple sessions. And so I'd have about 30 people in mine. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't five sessions at a time. It was five sessions over the day. Uh, okay. um, so there was 150 fundraisers of all different backgrounds, all different um, charity sizes, causes uh, in this full church. Oh, um, all eyes on me. And they asked yeah. me whether I wanted a, um, a headset mic or a lectern mic. Yeah. Um, and I was torn between like being a university professor and like Britney Spears slash Steve <laughs> Jobs. Um, you wanted so Britney, obviously. I, obviously, it's Britney bitch. So yeah. <laughs> went for that. Um, but because I had that and because I was talking on something I did know I knew quite well, yeah. it kind of feels like I've prepared myself for the worst, I yeah. guess. I don't know yeah. what the worst would be, but yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what the worst could be. My my first uh, was only to twenty people, and there was no microphone or anything, and I was still Ooh. shitting it. Like it was still, like, like a pretty. And, and even now, I kind of find smaller rooms harder sometimes. It just. Oh, I I like, totally get that because you're more aware of what other people might be thinking or doing. Yeah. Like when there's a big room, you're not really focused on anyone's yeah. reaction or, yeah. or whatever. But um, yeah, yeah, I can totally see that. Well, good on you. And then you're presenting that same session at um, fundraising conventions? So I'm uh, presenting an improved version um, okay. in collaboration with Vicky Wallace, who okay. is uh, a peer of mine from Hope for Children, absolutely incredible fundraiser. So we've kind of come together, t torn that session apart and put new meat on the skeleton, which I'm quite nice. excited for. Good um, on you. And then I'm also doing two panel conversations at fundraising convention, um, which is weird because I've gone from volunteering last year to speaking every day this year. That's um, excellent. But it's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, and those panels are on personal development okay. and on the next generation of philanthropists. So, so tell me this, because people listening to this, I mean, what we're encouraging them to do is try and kind of uh, achieve their next step. Yeah. Um, the panels, that's not something you applied for, is it? Were you invited to do that? Um, so one of them I sort of applied um, I knew the person putting, I knew both people putting together the panels. Okay, okay. One of them, they just asked me. Um, the other was the Tony Elisha Foundation, and they asked okay. their cohort who wanted to be on it. Nice. And I put my hand up. Um, but I think it's worth saying with fundraising conventions um, that they all have application processes, and that wasn't necessarily something that I was aware mm -hmm. of. Um, like, I think I always assumed that people were just approached and the same people were always going to be approached because when mm -hmm. you're when you're Rob Woods and everyone knows that you speak at every 
convention, you're, you're going to approach Rob Woods because he'll, he'll speak and he'll give a great talk. Mm. Um, but actually, you can just apply yourself. And if you have a good idea, it goes through. So yeah. it's definitely worth knowing. And what's really interesting is your three sessions. You've got one where you applied for it, one where you've just been invited because you know someone, and one where you... Well, how did the third one come about? I kind of remember. Um, it but was a, it was like a closed totally application so, in a way. Yeah. yeah so, so, but you put your hand up for it. So, all of them are you putting yourself out there, um, more or less, yeah. but in in slightly different ways. And and that's usually how these good things come about. Mm, definitely, that's awesome. Congratulations. Nice. Um, number seven on your list, you've crossed out. Visit three charities, projects, uh, or three charity services. So, you have visited three. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, when I was at uni, I went to Might and Hospice's um, hospice centre to look at it because we were looking at them as one of our charity partners of a fundraising society. And that was just mm -hmm. a really awesome trip to really understand what that kind of end of life care looked like. Um, mm -hmm. It was really, really great. Um, and then I visited East African Playgrounds projects in Uganda and Raising Futures Kenya's projects in Kenya um, in various roles. Nice. So, yeah. Nice one. Good on you. Number eight, you want to join three meaningful fundraising communities? Yeah. So I guess I mean like Facebook groups or yeah. LinkedIn groups or whatever. Um, and I'm aware that there are quite a few out there that I'm either not in or don't pay enough attention to, like the <laughs> IOF. Like the IOF, like special interest groups exist. Um, yeah. And I'm aware they exist, but I always well, I just haven't uh, really got round to uh, – mining them for their worth um, yeah. but the small international development charities network is a wicked facebook group uh, specifically for you guessed it small international development charities um but the openness and resource sharing and the specialties that people share on that is absolutely huge there's a massive google drive full of resources um from fundraising strategies to comms policies to wow. child safeguarding policies um and then fundraising chat Mm. is really really great um yeah. and completely varied sometimes people ask for life-size sheep um other times people are sharing <laughs> uh, job posts um yeah it's good it's great i used i used to be pretty active in fundraising chat before i quit facebook but it's great there's thousands of people thousands and they're all fundraisers from around the world and it's kind of like um you know, you never have to make a mistake that someone's already made, or Absolutely. you never have to want yeah. for a document. You know, like you said about the the other group, that if you if you're looking for a child safety policy, or if you're looking for a volunteer form, or you're looking for anything, someone just sends it across to you for yeah, free. Absolutely, it's um, amazing, and it's it's similar to to pizza for losers. I think in a way that you can just post being like, I'm about to make this mistake. Can someone stop yeah. me, please? Yeah. Um, so yeah, those are the two that I'm in and, and regularly participate in, but there's not really a third community. So if anyone knows of another Facebook or LinkedIn group that's particularly active, it'd be really great to, to hear about it. This is, you're just like getting people to campaign for you. It's like an X factor of <laughs> fun, fundraising groups. More or less, yeah, why not? Um, number nine, you want to spend some time with fundraisers from a different country. Um, and you said, does Scotland count? Because you've got Gemma and Danny. And I suppose with Brexit, you know, maybe you maybe, might be losing Scotland. So. Yeah, maybe. So it's, it's possible. Um, um, I don't know. I think different fundraising communities are really, really interesting and they have different cultures. And I think there's a lot to learn from it. Obviously, Scotland has some differences, right? But not necessarily yeah. the same. And and I mean, I'm Irish. So, you know, we're, yeah. we're about 10 years behind you. So you can add that me on that. Um, and you can. Yeah, I mean, it's great to go to international conferences, which I think you have on your list as well. I do, um, yeah. I'm really um, keen to see just differences. Um, in particular, I find it interesting because both... So you've just described Ireland as behind. And mm. Canada has also been described as behind. <laughs> and I'm... Uh, by Canadians, it's okay, I can say that. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually have Canadian friends, 25. <laughs> Some of my uh, best friends are Canadian. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, sorry about it. And, uh, <laughs> I'm going to stop. <laughs> uh, yeah, I... I I find it interesting. Like, what do you mean by behind? Um, I don't know. I mean, sometimes I think of, you know, it's obviously a different market. Um, community is a bit different for us. Church giving is really big for, for um, Irish, a lot of Irish fundraisers. So there's elements that are different. But then there's other things like when you look at digital and when you look at, um, you know, certain events and, and technology, especially I always find like England is almost a bit of a crystal ball that you can look at what charities are doing in England and you know eventually it's going to come across to Ireland. 
Um, right. But but they get started in England because you have that 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 mass of people. You have like a tipping point where it makes mm -hmm. more sense mm -hmm. to go in that market, and then eventually, because we're so close to you, it kind of starts to filter across to us. So I mean, I think we learn a lot from from English fundraising conferences and and English fundraising groups. Um, but I mean, I I would say there's stuff we're in line with, and maybe stuff we do better. Mm -hmm. um, but but I suppose that's the benefit of looking at different markets is is we learn from all of them. And I've learned a lot from Canadians. I've learned a lot from English and Americans. And and one of my favorite conferences is IFC, where you get like such a melting pot of um, mm -hmm. international speakers. I remember I remember one year being at IFC, and I worked I walked past the room, and someone was running a session on mobile giving in Africa. And it's just like, oh, wow, that's like, you know, something I've never even yeah. really kind of thought about because it's not relevant to me. But this is cool. That's really this cool. Is, yeah. This is going on right now. And, and there's an expert in that room teaching other people who need to improve that. And, and that's why I love these international things. Yeah, for sure. That's it's really, cool. really cool. Hey, let me just take a little break from this amazing podcast to tell you about a wee little event that is happening over in Toronto, Canada, uh, run by a couple of good friends of mine, John Lepp and Jen Love. They are hosting Donor Love and Donuts. This is a great event. Now, they might be old, they might be uh, Canadian, they might be all sorts of things, but this event is going to be super fantastic for many reasons. For a start, they're both great speakers. I love them both. I see them speak whenever I can, not just because they're friends, but because they're entertaining, wonderful, emotional, fantastic speakers. They share a lot of great knowledge, and they're going to be sharing a lot of great knowledge at this event. They're going to be talking about all things donor love, how you sprinkle donor love along your annual program, your legacy program through your case for support, all your fundraising, they teach you how to bring donor love into everything you do so that you can raise more. Uh, they're running this half-day event in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And one of the cool things about this is it is a pay-what-you-like event. You know I'm loving these pay-what-you-like events these days. So if you think it's worth 50 bucks, if you think it's worth 300 bucks, which I'm sure it is because these guys are superstars, then you can pay that. But if you're really stingy or you have no money or your boss is giving you shit and won't let you spend any more budget this year, then you can pay nothing. You can go for free. You can bring along your boss and show them why they're being such a dick and why they should put some money into this. Uh, and whatever it is, whatever you decide to pay, you're going to go. You're going to get loads of donuts free. You're going to get coffee free. You're going to get tea free. And you're going to get a whole bunch of knowledge from these two wonderful, lovely experts. Go to this. This will be great if you're in the Toronto neighborhood or anywhere within the region of it. If you're in what up? I can't think of any other places in Canada like Vancouver. That's not close at all. But uh, um, yeah, other places in Canada. Just make the journey. It will be amazing. If I was anywhere near them, I would be going to this. This is going to be a great event. Search for Donor Love and Donuts on Facebook. Uh, search for it on Eventbrite to, to get your tickets or just check out the Agents of Good website and they will have all the details there go to this right back to our podcast my friends so you said you want to start a cause related story notebook which seems to be a rob woods invention or a rob woods concept uh what is this because this is this means nothing to me oh he did a, um, a session at a convention last year that i saw about um how you should have a notebook on your desk or wherever you go as a fundraiser and when you hear a beneficiary story or a service statistic or something that um, sticks out to you, you just write it down. Okay. Um, and just having a notebook specifically for that. So you always have dozens of stories literally at your fingertips that you can flip through. That because that, that you can read before a donor meeting or on a hard day. Um, and you can just have uh, some things about your, your cause always with you. Um, and I think that was really genuinely a great moment for me and something I wanted to share because I think East African playgrounds are getting a lot better at, at capturing stories and, and telling stories. Um, but historically, they've been a lot more statistic based. Mm -hmm. And um, a complaint of mine as a fundraiser was that I didn't have that many stories. Um, but I realized that actually a lot of the times they were just said briefly over a Skype call and not recorded. Mm -hmm. And so by starting to write them down, that, that archive is really built. Um, and it's something that I think all fundraisers um, could benefit from is uh, just capturing the, the the side comments that get made and and fleshing those out into stories where they can. Nice. So you have a paper notebook now that you're writing this into. Yeah, what is it? What is this? What's the design? What does it say on the cover? 
Oh, it's like a really basic Tuka notepad. It was okay. the one that I got when I got back from the office. It's not, unfortunately, not as inspiring as yeah, you'd like yeah. it to be. No, one of these cool ones. Okay. Uh, number 11, you want to do a ridiculous charity challenge, which you've done. I have indeed. I've done a few. Tell um, me that you've said here you've cycled from London to Paris and yeah. you drank nothing but water for a month. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the water for a month was terrible for three days. Yeah. Uh, and then okay for like two weeks and in the last week i was like i'm so healthy i'm the healthiest <laughs> i've ever been i'm never gonna drink another liquid again yeah. hit, the first of, hit the first of february and i obviously immediately had a tango ice blast because it was the most <laughs> flavorful drink i could think of <laughs> and didn't look back um and then i also yeah cycled from london to paris uh for practical action who are oh, a, nice, yeah. uh, a wicked international charity um and i was once told a few years ago uh, that some people hadn't believed that I'd cycle from London to Paris because I don't talk about it enough. And I'm the kind of person <laughs> that would brag more if I don't. Fucking hell. Um, That's so, harsh. So just saying, for the record, I've cycled from London to Paris. I'll say it a few more times, and then yeah. people will start to believe it. Yeah, it helps. <laughs> that's, that's harsh. That's harsh. Mm. Uh, number 12, you haven't done yet. Face of fear through fundraising. What do so, you mean by that? So this one is coming. Um, I'm doing an ab sale uh, for Raising Futures Kenya. Um, I'm terrified of heights. Yeah. Um, and I thought it would be a good uh, fundraising angle, um, personally, as, as someone doing a community fundraiser, uh, to let my friends pay to watch me brick it, basically. Nice. <laughs> um, nice. So, yeah, that's uh, March 16th. Um, that's probably... next week. That is next weekend. Thank you for noticing. Oh my <laughs> uh, and I keep watching videos of people abseil down the Owen building in Sheffield, getting about halfway and be like, no. Oh my God. Are you, are you shitting yourself? I am a little bit, yeah. Do you um, ever watch those videos? Like, I, I wouldn't say I have a fear of heights. No, I don't have a fear of heights. But when I watch those, like, um, almost like parkour videos where they climb really tall towers and do, like, yep. pull ups off the edge and stuff yep. like that. Nope. Oh my God. Nope. Nope. No. Uh, okay. no. <laughs> I'll, I'll, link to, I'll link to a few in the podcast description. Um, convince someone else to do a charity challenge, which is surely a big part of your job. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, so you've done that. I have done that more Good. than a, more than a handful of times. You'll be glad yeah. to hear. And which is, I suppose, part, part of why you're an award-winning fundraiser because you've already done it. I guess so. Um, become a regular donor to three causes. You currently give money to Cruise Bereavement Care and Raising Futures Kenya. Yeah, I was really worried when I put that on my list that loads of charities would be like, I'm regular giver. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's pitch to him. But luckily, that hasn't happened yet. Yeah. Um, he says planting the seed of an idea in several people's heads, I'm sure. So you, um, need, a, you need a third. Uh, I am open to a third when it comes <laughs> organically, is yeah. what I'm going to say. That's fine. Um, yeah, so I give to Cruise Bereavement Care, who are a bereavement counselling charity that really helped me out when my dad died. Uh -huh. um, and I give to the charity that I'm a trustee of because obviously I think they're sick. Nice. Um, but yeah, nice. that's it so far. Okay, and I love your next one is uh, to become a lapsed donor. <laughs> I, <laughs> that's I, very I, optimistic of you there, I've, Andy. I've technically done this by mistake, so I don't know if it counts or not. It was very recently. My credit card expired. Mm. Um, and I, uh, To be fair, I put it on the list because I kind of wanted to see uh, from the perspective of a donor, the journey of what happens when you stop. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, yeah, my credit card expired uh, for my regular donation to uh, Racing Futures. And again, I'm a trustee of them. So the CEO was very quick to pick up the phone. And yeah, like, really? Oh, yeah, it's interesting. You're, so your card's not working? It's wonderful. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, okay, Vic, I'll get the new card. Don't worry. Because I mean, <laughs> I've, I've seen, I've done a lot of mystery shopping and sometimes you lapse and um, you, ne you never hear from them. You know, Absolutely. it just goes completely unnoticed. Yeah, and I, th I think that's what the the three donations and the laps donation was leading to. Like, I've never done any mystery shopping kind of activity, and I'm really keen to. Yeah, um, yeah. So, that's yeah. Nice. Uh, number 16, you want to write a will and feature a charity in it. You you don't have a will yet? I'm 24. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I do not. Um, I mean, I can leave, like, half a packet of polos to my housemate. <laughs> and my can I, can I give you a Dr. Pepper? You can have my Dr. Pepper Thanks. if there's any left at the time. Yeah. Um, and I can leave, what, the £3.20 in my bank account to uh, cruise bereavement care to console yeah. those that are clearly devastated by the loss. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, I don't have a will yet. But when okay. I do, and I want you to don't... have a will as like a life goal, yeah. um, I want to have enough stuff to make it worth leaving one. <laughs> yeah, that um, makes sense. 
that some of it goes to charity. Yeah. I, I had to write a will. The first time I wrote a will was when I bought a house with my ex girlfriend, and um, and we had a son. And I was like, oh, I'd like to put um, a charity in it. I'd like to leave a little bit to charity. Mm. And she and she told me to fuck off. And she was like, no. <laughs> she was like, no fucking Ooh. way. She's like, you have to leave it to your son. And, Great. You know, it's like, and, and I can it was, see that I can see why that relationship didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was so interesting, and I kind of I get it because it's kind of like even now I, there isn't a charity in my will because I'm like, yeah, well, maybe I should, you know, just leave it all to my son. Why would I not? Because again, I don't have a whole lot of stuff to leave. Um, mm. So how can I start dishing it out? But it was just the really interesting attitude because she's not a fundraiser. Um, mm. That mm. perception was like, don't fucking leave it to a charity. You know, leave it to people here and they can decide to give if they want to give. Sure, for sure. Um, but yeah, that was funny. You want to write a full funding bid, which is a very exciting thing to put on your bucket list. You know? Yeah, it's also very ambitious. Um, yeah. I've done very little Trust and Foundations fundraising. Yeah. Um, other than like read over a few bids for our trust and foundations officer, mm -hmm. I I wouldn't confidently say it. And no, I'd, I'd confidently say it if I phrase it like this: it's the only mainstream form of fundraising I've not really done anything Ooh, towards. Mainstream in that like major like in terms of has a track at IOF FC. Oh yeah, um, kind nice. of thing. Oh, actually, I haven't done legacy either. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just it's something that I'm aware of that I haven't done, and it's yeah. something I'd really like to try. Uh, to do from start to finish um, because I think it would teach me a lot about a style of fundraising I don't know that much about. I like that. I like the awareness of the, the bits you haven't done and you want to bring mm. them in. I like that. Number 18, you want to make a high-level ask, which you've done a few times. I have indeed, yeah. Um, again, I think I wanted to make it um, as broad and as varied as it could, so I wanted to include lots of different types of fundraising. Mm -hmm. um, and Yeah, I'm, I'm fortunate enough that I've been able to do that a few times, and a few times they said yes. They nice. Able to, able and the, and those stuff. different <laughs> those different types of fundraising come into nineteen and twenty. You've said you want to approach a corporate for a partnership, and you yeah. want to do some face to face fundraising. So you're trying to kind of get around the different forms of fundraising, be an yeah. all rounder. Yeah, for sure. I just I think it's important um, for someone who wants to be in fundraising for a long time and is quite mm -hmm. ambitious to, if you're going to be leading a team that are doing some work, that you've done some of that work, so you can kind of relate to their. Yeah. struggles a bit um, that's fair and i mean because all fundraising all fundraising kind of overlaps doesn't it so it, yeah it helps absolutely. to have your toe in a bit of it um number 21 you want to have a coffee with the supporter you haven't done that do you not drink coffee so i i have i, I do drink coffee uh, possibly too much um <laughs> i have i have now done that since publishing the list um but i was doing a lot of um one-to-ones with community fundraisers rather than uh, so people that were raising funds rather than donating them themselves mm -hmm. um a lot of the times that i was meeting with corporates or i was meeting with um higher level donors it was a very functional meeting so maybe coffee was involved um but it never felt like a stewardship coffee which sure. i guess hasn't been phrased so well there um but I, i've i don't necessarily think have a stewardship coffee i think everyone would just look at me and roll their eyes um well you as well you didn't think someone would be going down this list word by word yeah and that's confront, true confronting that, you and it? that is very true um but i've subsequently done that because we recently had someone at east african playgrounds um who has started giving and also started introducing us to her network um and so I have started relatively regularly catching up with her just to see who else she um, might have to introduce us to or ideas that she's thought of. Um, and it's been a really fruitful relationship. So yeah, I've now ticked that one off. I just haven't nice. updated it yet. I like it. Number 22, you want to be a beneficiary. Yeah. Um, and you, you have, you mentioned when your father passed away, cruise bereavement care helped you. Yeah. And I've and also it, been a mentee of the Tony Ellisher Foundation. Yeah, we had um, Susan from Tony Ellisher Foundation on the podcast before. I say we, I mean me. Um, <laughs> the talking royal about, we. Yeah, <laughs> Tony Ellisher Foundation. Which so you're a mentee. I from am Tony yeah. Ellisher Foundation, and so yeah, that's. Yeah, yeah. Um, would you tell us who your mentor is? Uh, yeah, it was uh, Lisa Russell from Think Consultancy Solutions. Okay. Um, absolutely wicked woman. Yeah. Uh, like absolute fountain of knowledge. It was an incredibly yeah. beneficial relationship. Yeah. You got a lot out of that, uh, the Tony Ellisher Foundation? Yeah, a, a lot, a lot. Um, and I think that's one of the main things that I bang on about uh, when people meet me, is that mm -hmm. if, if they're a younger aspiring fundraiser to apply for the Tony Ellisher Foundation is um, 
one of my first bits of advice. And I actually just found out that one of my good friends uh, got on the scheme today. So that's oh, really yeah? For, oh, for that's him. cool. Yeah. Yeah, so. I love them. I love what they're doing. Um, you want to have a nuanced opinion on CRMs and a nuanced opinion on face-to-face -face fundraising. <laughs> yeah, I just feel like uh, they're the kind of things that fundraisers talk about in the bar a lot. And I would say, like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, <laughs> I I will admit that I'm not the first to fall in love with the CRM system, mm. um, but also I've only ever used one. Mm -hmm. um, so when I'm shaking my hand at my CRM system, I'm not going to name it because I don't particularly love it. Um, I don't know if it's the concept of a CRM system that I'm shaking my hand at or that particular one. Um, so I'd like to try a few more and work out if I just am lazy or if there's um, there's good and bad software out there. No, I think it's safe to say you can hate all CRM systems. And yeah, they all okay, do a little bit, sure. but yeah, you're, you're always going to hate them in a little bit of a way. Yeah, um, sure. And then, like face-to-face -face fundraising, that has some good points as well, but there's always going to be bits about it we hate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I... I don't know, I have a lot of opinions about face-to-face -face fundraising that I've never really made coherent. Mm -hmm. um, and I think eventually that one will go on to be a blog post because I wanted mm. it, I wanted the list to be like something I could continue to talk about, kind of nice. like an, an overarching theme of the blog. And I think that's something that I want to consciously think about and talk to both face-to-face -face fundraisers and non-face-to-face -face fundraisers about. Um, and develop my thoughts because I definitely think there is uh, a bit of a divide there and mm -hmm. some prejudice there and I'd like to understand it better and have my own thoughts so yeah nice I like it uh, number 25 you want to take part in a network mapping exercise for a charity to see who I can introduce them to beyond my fundraising network yeah uh, so uh, network mapping is obviously when you work out who you know and mm -hmm. who the people that you know know uh, it's a really common community fundraising tool for getting people to a fundraising target to be like, rather than asking your mum for a small donation, why don't you ask your mum to do a non-school uniform day at the school that she works at? Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of a, a, a tool of spreading influence. Um, and it's one of the things that I advocate quite a lot is about not just looking at supporters or donors or fundraisers as the instant cash value they can give you, but the other things they can add, the passion mm. they can offer, the time they can give you, the people they can introduce you to. Um, and I wanted to be able to do that uh, from both sides because I, I run that quite a lot myself in my job and I'd quite like okay. to, to have been on the other side of that, okay. um, which I did to source a couple of volunteers um, for a few different organizations. Nice. So it was successful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, number 26, you want to become the best storyteller I can be, which is, oh, I think you've set yourself up for a tough one here because uh, you can always be better, can't you, uh, until yeah. the day you die? Yeah, yeah. Eventually, I think one day I'll just decide that I've done it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so how do you become a better storyteller? I think Practice. by, uh, yeah, practicing, being conscious of your craft, uh, mm -hmm. reading more, mm. um, doing more mystery shopping, um, being more critically aware of your own voice compared to others. Um, mm. And I think that's one of the things that really interests me about um, different countries, fundraising markets. And it's also one of the reasons that I wanted to be a beneficiary so that I could see how it feels to be spoken about oh, in yeah. fundraising comms. Oh, wow. Um, and I think it's just something that you have to work towards. And one day I'll retire and be like, yep, I'm going to be the best I'm going to get. So yeah. <laughs> there you go. Mic drop. Yeah, um, exactly. It, in terms of as a beneficiary for the Cruise Bereavement Charity, um, did you tell your story, you know, back to them? Have, have you have you engaged with them on that level as a beneficiary? Um, not, not massively, but mm. mo mostly because they haven't asked. Mm -hmm. um, if they did, I would. Um, yeah. And... Um, I'm a I'm a beneficiary that's also a donor and a fundraiser for them. I've done some events for them. Wow. Um, so I do follow quite closely what they say. It's not I, I've never had like me as a case study shown, but I still yeah. relate to the people that they're speaking about as their beneficiaries. Wow. Um, and it's something that I'm always quite conscious of, and try and map that over to how I would feel if I was um, one of the people getting school training in Kenya, for example. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder what I wonder what it says about you on their database. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, uh, they, I, yeah, I don't know. They're... We'll see. Yeah, we'll yeah. leave it up. Maybe, to maybe, reason. maybe they'll let me know after this. Who knows? Um, and twenty-seven, you have you wanted to become a trustee, and you did. You, did, yeah. you're a trustee for Raising Futures Kenya. I am indeed. Um, yeah, I think I. Um, 
I think in in fundraising worlds, you often see people railing against their trustees. Or mm. um, I was in particular putting quite a lot of proposals towards my trustee board. Uh, that was how I changed from challenges officer to partnerships manager. Um, and I've always had quite a positive experience, but I was very aware that I didn't really understand uh, their incentive structures, what might appeal to them, why they mm. might do it, and um, how maybe to to level with them and, and leverage them the best I could. And the best way to do that was to be one myself. Nice. Good so, on you. Yeah. And you've, you've been on the board for nearly a year now. Yeah, nearly a year. And I have loved it. Yeah, it's been a bit, yeah. of, a, a bit of a baptism by fire, um, yeah. as I think most small charity trustee positions are. But it's also been a huge learning curve. Like, I don't think I'm even close to the fundraiser I was a year ago and definitely not two years ago. Um, and hugely that's down to the Tony Elisha Foundation and the trusteeship together that have nice. made me just much more aware and considerate of the wider world around me, I think. Yeah, I think it, I think it's really important for fundraisers to to dabble as a trustee or, or be a trustee because when you're, you know, we do complain about trustees a lot and I love complaining about trustees, but I've also been one and I, you know, you kind of know how stretched it can be, how yeah. difficult it could be, how fundraising mm. isn't necessarily no, the number one priority for a trustee and it just i think it changes your tone when you're speaking to them or it changes Absolutely, your approach yeah. anyway because you start to realize that there's a lot more going on that maybe you hadn't necessarily thought about yeah for sure and i think that really struck true to me um with raising futures as well because i went in uh to focus on fundraising because that was uh where i came from and have immediately got more involved in overall governance and in particular mm. our relationship with the kenyan organization um, because that's where the work is, like that's what needs to be worked out right now. Sure. Um, and it's fascinating and it's taught me a lot, but it's also made me realize that just because something is a priority for me and maybe my colleagues doesn't make it a priority overall for the organization necessarily. Yeah. And yeah. there are ways of phrasing things and making decisions the easiest they can possibly be. Yeah, nice, good on you. Uh, number 28, we're approaching the end. Number 28, yeah, you want to me mentor a younger fundraiser? Yeah, uh, um, which combines with 29, I guess, of being mentors. Um, mm -hmm. As I said, I got a huge, huge amount out of that, and I would like to reach a position where I feel I can pass that on. Um, I've done uh, some coaching for uh, entry-level fundraisers in terms of a lot of the students that go on to do the Gorilla Trek. I have um, convinced by hook or crook that maybe fundraising is a career they should consider um nice. and help them get their first roles but i don't necessarily think that counts in the same way um but i would like to think in uh five to ten years when i'm in a more senior position that i will um pay that back like an end goal would be i guess being a mentor for the tony elisha foundation but yeah that, that's a long long way off yet i think yeah but I mean, there's always you, you. You have a great track record behind you. I know it's only a few years officially in fundraising, but there's people who are just coming into the profession right now who you're certainly in a position to mentor and and tick that off the list now. Like you've, yeah. you've done some great stuff. I guess so. If anyone wants, uh, reach out. I guess <laughs> it's funny because I think pe well, most people, unless you're a complete narcissist, people don't like to think of themselves as mentors because you never. I think a lot of people never think they're ready for it. Sure. Um, but there's always people who are, you know, maybe a few steps behind you in, in any profession. Um, yeah, and I, I think that was a big part of, of putting it on the list and making it public, mm. hoping that someone would see it and ask. Yeah, um, yeah. Because I, if, if they feel like there's benefit to be given from me, then I'm more than happy to try. Yeah, that's um, lovely, yeah. Because, yeah, yeah it, it says a lot about someone if they're just like, hey, guys, I'm a mentor now. Come and yeah. learn from me. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then you've been mentored, as you said. And then your final one on the bucket list is to meet your charity idol. Who's this? Uh, it's Mandy Johnson. Um, yeah. We have met briefly once um, at the fundraising awards uh, last July. Um, yeah. I was uh, conscious, <laughs> um, but not necessarily in the place to have a, a deep, meaningful chat right there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was having a good night, shall we say. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but. Um, I, she is someone that I consistently, whenever she publishes anything about fundraising or mm -hmm. about governance or about staff structures, I just always, it always really speaks to me. Um, in particular, um, one of her pieces about, uh, I think it's called 20 million raise and only one mental breakdown. Yeah. Um, I think one of the, one of the things that I'm really conscious of in fundraising, um, and in myself in particular is this 
endless drive that we could and should do better mm -hmm. um, and that we often identify ourselves as working for causes rather than for organizations and how that can be problematic mm -hmm. um, and she is one of the people that I've seen advocate against that most frequently and most eloquently and it, it really uh, speaks to me um, she's also a small charities uh, guru slash expert mm -hmm. um, which I like also so yeah nice i love that well that seems a very achievable one she's a very open and welcoming person i'm sure she is indeed i'm sure your paths will cross very soon i love the i love the idea of having a charity idol i do i had i think stephen pigeon was my charity idol mm -hmm. i mean he still is a little bit and um and now i know him quite well and i do love that idea of like that there's almost rock stars in the fundraising yeah, world sure. that you can look up to it's hilarious yeah for sure um, um Unfortunately, we're at the end of the list. That's your that 30, 30 items on your fundraising bucket list. So I'm sorry, that might have been a bit of a painful exercise for you no, to, to go down and be pulled up on it. Is there any big changes you'd make for that or anything that you think is glaringly missing now? No, I, I don't necessarily think so. I think there, uh, but I did try and make it something that other people might want to do. So mm -hmm. maybe there are some goals that aren't on there uh, that I have, um, but they're also things that are slightly more personal um mm -hmm. like personal career aspirations of like where i want to be in x amount of time um but that's not necessarily something that i would feel comfortable sharing publicly sure um especially because you don't want to tell a, an employer that you want to leave in x number yeah. of years or whatever yeah. right um i'm just kidding i'm staying forever yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um but yeah no i'm i'm pretty happy with it yeah. um i wrote it on a 14 hour bus ride to kenya so i had plenty okay. of plenty of time to to mull it over yeah. um and yeah the fact that other people have engaged with it um and the fact that other people have engaged with it and ticked off significantly more than me as well gives me hope um i yeah. think i think darren pike is the person i've seen with the most and he was on 19 or 20. oh wow um so he's doing pretty well um so it's become like an andy king yeah. challenge now to see how yeah. many you can take uh, i mean not quite uh, but it's a good yeah. little it's a good little bar opener if nothing else um, yeah yeah so so yeah no, I, I like it. I, it's a great recommendation to people because, like I said at the beginning, I think everyone has those little goals that they'd love to do, the people they'd like to meet, the things mm. they want to do. Like, um, like I said about my speaking when I wanted to start that, and I think by putting it out there, fundraisers are so generous in terms of helping each other For achieve sure, their goals sure. that that I think only good things can come by putting it out there. Um, and so I, I love that you've kind of led the way in in making it so so well put together. Thanks. Um, Andy, if anyone wants to, uh, I suppose, help you in your fundraising goals, or if they want to kind of start putting their own fundraising bucket list together, or they just want to hear more about what you have to say, where's the best place for them to find you? Sure. Yeah. So there's two key places. Uh, Twitter is Andy King Raising, um, which has recently changed. So I'm trying to get people to know that that's a thing. Um, yeah. Or um, the contact section of the blog, uh, which is responsibleraising.wordpress.com. Uh, nice. I have a contact form that goes straight to my email. Um, so, yeah. Cool. And I will link to your Twitter and your website uh, in the pod podcast description. So everyone do go ahead and visit that. Andy's great on Twitter. And I'm loving where this blog is going. Still early days, but everything so far has been great. So good on you. Thanks. Thanks, man. Uh, um, and thanks a million for coming on the podcast. It's great. We'll have to, um, I'll have to get you on again to talk about something less... Um, Less about you, I suppose. Compensational, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. More, more well, wide-reaching. <laughs> do, do you happen to have any nuanced opinions on CRM systems? <laughs> <laughs> it seems like you're the kind of person that might now. Yeah. That, that cross now. As, as soon as I see that cross off, I'm going to invite you on for your okay. nuanced opinions. Cool, cool, cool. Can't <laughs> wait. Cool, 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 cool. <laughs> All right, Andy, listen, thanks a million. Uh, I won't keep you any longer. Uh, really good to talk to you, and, and we'll thanks. talk to you again, I hope. Yeah, sweet. Cheers, Simon. Thank you. You've been listening to Simon Scriver's Amazingly Ultimate Fundraising Superstar Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and head over to changefundraising.com to learn more or get in touch with Simon. Or don't. Whatever. You're big enough to make your decisions. Hello, this is Morgan Freeman. For discounts on Simon's best-selling online fundraising courses, Go to www.changefundraising.com forward slash training and use coupon code podcast. Complete them in your own time, wherever you want. Get busy living or get busy buying.